Well, good evening. Uh, this is attempt number two at our devotions. It looks like I lost, well, I was losing um, power, and then I was reconnecting into power, but then I lost sound. So uh, I want to check and see. I may look over toward my son and see. I guess I do have sound. He's told me that. So I'm back in gear, and we'll just see who uh, who clicks in. Um, if not, maybe you'll look at it later. But I take this as a direct attack from the enemy because I was in this wonderful passage from Hebrews chapter 10, one of my top 10 Bible verses, uh, looking at Hebrews 10, verse 10, excuse me, verse 14. But we were at verse verse 12. Uh, just to reiterate, I won't go through it all again, but in Hebrews 10, he's showing why Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross was better. Great. Thanks, everybody, for letting me know you're watching again and you're getting sound. Uh, this is, again, one of my favorite Bible passages, and Satan won't get the day on this one, or technology. Uh, and my son was to the rescue, so praise the Lord for that. Um, so in the Old Testament, the sacrifice had to be done every day and every year, and it's just a reminder that it doesn't help us overcome sin. We just get forgiven for the sins we've had. But now with Jesus, um, we something has, has is different. Um, he, no longer burnt offerings back at verse uh, 6, and sacrifices are no longer required. Uh, after saying that that's not pleasing to God, he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. Jesus has done the will of the Father in heaven. And by doing his will, um, he, his will, his, his plan, fulfilling his plan that came uh, from the beginning of time, right in the Garden of Eden. Of course, God had the plan before the creation, but we hear that plan when he says to the serpent, you will, you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. Um, uh, that's God's plan. And Jesus fulfilled that plan. He was faithful to God's plan, even to giving his life uh, on the cross. Uh, he does away with the first sacrifices and offerings, sin offerings, in order to establish the second, doing the will of God. And by that will, by the will of God, by the, the will of Jesus fulfilling the will of God, um, by that will, we have been sanctified, not just justified, not just fully forgiven. Uh, that's what justification is. But sanctification means to be made holy, whether you know it or not. And we talked about this last night at church when we were looking at the confession and absolution. By Jesus' obedience to the will of the Father, by his death on the cross that God had willed to save all humanity, those sacrifices, those animal sacrifices, all just a stopgap measure to bring us to the point where God saved the world, delivered us from sin, forgave us, and we have been sanctified. Past tense. We have been made holy through the offering of the body of Jesus, once for all. Verse 12. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Again, he sat on the cross. It is finished. He was done. And he went to the, after going to the cross and dying for our sins and making us holy, crushing Satan's head. He was buried on the third day, rose again, and he ascended into heaven. Because after instructing his disciples and authorizing them to go out and make more disciples, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He'd finished his work. Now, today in heaven, he's, as we've heard throughout Hebrews, he's praying for you and me and all the saints every day. He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. It's mopping up operations. D-Day has happened. D-Day plus 20. Uh, Germany was not going to push us off the European continent. And as we kept landing more people, the, the doom of, of Hitler was absolutely certain. There would be many deaths, many battles, but there was no uncertainty about the end. Hitler was going to be defeated. From that moment on, by Jesus now sitting in heaven, the victory is won. 
There's still some battles going on, but the end is absolutely certain. Um, then my, this is one of my top verses. For by a single offering, he, Jesus, has perfected for all time. Uh, that's a past tense word. By a single offering, by his death on the cross in 28 AD, he has, so that just means we got six years to go. I always wished in some ways I could be a, a serving pastor when, when uh, we'd celebrate that. I just don't think I'm going to continue working uh, for another six years. But, but I'm, I'm going to be a child of God and I'm going to be reading the scripture and I'm going to be recounting that Jesus Christ uh, is, uh, is um, uh, on, on that day in, uh, in April in 28 AD. I'm going to be remembering that Jesus Christ uh, has paid the price for our sins and we are forgiven. Um, we are sanctified and we are set free. Oh, excuse me. 28 AD was the day year he started his, his ministry. Uh, he died in 30 AD. I was just checking my Bible where I keep these notes. It was April 9th, 30 AD, that the resurrection happened. So just uh, um, uh, Saturday and, and then Friday, uh, it would have been April 7th, uh, 28 AD, 30 AD, that Jesus uh, died for our sins. On that single day, by that single offering, he has perfected, it's completely finished. Adrian, uh, Roberto, uh, Tom, Fred, Shirley, uh, everyone else, Laura, everyone else who's been watching. Um, on, on, I think the day would be April 7th, 30 AD. On that date, by a single offering, his death on the cross, he has perfected. You are not only forgiven, you have been made holy. Remember in the Old Testament, all the sacrifices could get you forgiven for a year, but then you were just going to be continuing to sin. Now, what do you mean, Pastor Bob? I, I no longer sin? No. Here's the rest of the verse. I, I just love this verse. It's the in one verse, the picture of the whole Christian life. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. The word perfected and the word sanctified are the same word. Um, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. We are now no longer guilty, but we still sin. Remember, it's that mopping up celebration. He's now seated at the right hand of the Father until his enemies have been made a footstool for his feet. The enemies are still out there. The end is certain. Uh, the victory has the the ultimate victory has been won, but there's kind of a mopping up operations going on. Uh, it's certain because of the single offering, and in that offering he has made you perfect. But you're not yet. You still sin every day, and the only person I'm knocking to right now is myself because I see only myself. It's not like a church service or a Zoom call. Uh, Bob Quaintance is now you are made perfect, and so it's true also of Adrian and uh, Roberto, and Tom, and Fred, and everyone else on. You have been made perfect for all time. Those who are being sanctified, it's a participle. Uh, it's an ongoing work of God to make us, in my reality, become what I am in his reality. God has made me perfect. I am not yet but I will be. He has completely forgiven me all my sins. And in his eyes, in his time, because his time is different than our time, he sees me as I truly am. Not as I see myself now, not as you see me. He sees me in my perfection. Well, I don't see that yet, but I believe that. I believe that Jesus on the cross has forgiven my sins and he has forgiven yours. And he has made us perfect, those of us who are being sanctified in the process of being made holy. Now he quotes again from Jeremiah 31 as he did in, in, the, in the readings 
that we had in uh, in uh, uh, chapter eight, I believe it was, that we were reading. Um, I don't see it right now. Yes, it was chapter. No, it was, yeah, chapter eight, the end of chapter eight. The Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declared the Lord, I will put my laws in their heart, on their hearts and write them on their minds. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. And where there is, now as a summary statement of that, where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. You are completely forgiven. Jesus doesn't have to die anymore. Therefore, brothers, um, if this is true, then as we're being sanctified, as we're living into that new reality, how should we live? Here's what the writer of Hebrews says. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, the holy places in the temple, the holy of holies, into the very presence of God, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, that curtain that divided us from the holy, from the holy of holies, the curtain that was torn in two from top to bottom at the time of Jesus' death. Since we, have, um, since we have confidence to enter by the blood of Jesus, not ourselves, but because of Jesus, we can enter into the presence of God. Um, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God who sits there interceding for us, therefore, uh, we have these three encouragements. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. You're welcome into God's presence. Draw near by your faith in the death of Jesus. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, baptized and forgiven. This is God's work. Secondly, let us hold fast the confidence of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Do not forget who you are, that you are the child of God, that he has sent his son to die for you, that you are forgiven, that you are sanctified, and, and that you are welcome in his very presence. Let us hold fast to that confidence. And thirdly, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Let's, let's encourage each other because, boy, we need encouragement and we need each other to have that encouragement. And that's why we, we gather together as Christians. Because when we gather, we can remind each other you are forgiven. You are loved. You have been made perfect in God's eyes. We can look at each other, not with our human frailties, our brokenness, but we can see each other with the love of Jesus, with the eyes of Jesus uh, as he sees us, made new, forgiven. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Since we don't have to earn this, it's all done. It's all decided on April 7th and the resurrection, April 9th, 30 AD. Then let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. By the way, not neglecting uh, to meet together, as is the habit of some. But in, it's been more of a habit in these years that we of COVID that we've we've been separated from each other because of illness. But but we're going to the store. We're we're going to the park, we're going to school, we're going to work. Let's come back together. Um, uh, let's encourage each other. It would be so encouraging if our church for Easter or before just was full of people uh, uh, encouraging one another, <laughs> not condemning each other. We don't need that. We're forgiven, all of us not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near, Jesus is coming. Let's gather together and wait for him together. Now a warning. Now this is the fourth one, and, and they're often frightful warnings, but they're meant not to scare us because what is the truth? You are forgiven. You have been made perfect. 
You have been sanctified. You who are in the process of being sanctified. They're, they're, they're meant not to condemn us, uh, to scare us, that we've lost our salvation, but to warn us that going down the old path of life will not help us. It will only draw us away from God. So here's the fourth warning, verse 26 to, uh, uh, to 31. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, if we just, in our mind's eye, just keep doing what we want, not the will of God, if we just stubbornly and st steadfastly, intentionally disobey God, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there, uh, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by one who has trampled underfoot not the law of Moses, but the Son of God, and has profaned the blood of the covenant. God has died to set you free. Do you so care little about it that you just trample his blood underground? God forbid. By which this blood of the covenant by which he has by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. How could anyone do that? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, Deuteronomy 32. And again, from Psalm 50, verse 14, the Lord will judge his people. Here's the final statement of the warning. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. To, to, to stand before the judgment seat of God, there will be a reckoning. I think at the end of World War II, we were talking about that as a picture that after D-Day plus whatever, plus 20 days, when it was obvious that Germany would not be able to push us back into the sea, although they tried one more time in December, six months later, with the Battle of the Bulge, um, their, their last great attempt, the, the end w was sure. Um, but there was a lot of trouble to go through. Well, at the end of World War II, there was a, there was a vengeance that came, a judgment that came to those Jews who had committed atrocities. One of the reasons we were able to, not Jews, to those Germans who had committed atrocities. One of the reasons we were able to move forward with both the people of Germany and the people of Japan is because the leadership people were held accountable. And after that, then we could be friends again with the people who had really not anything to do with the formation of uh, the starting of those wars. They, they served their countries, but, but it was the leadership that had led them astray and had committed the atrocities. And anyone else personally who did was, was held accountable at Nuremberg. But, but after they were held accountable, we could reconnect with the people. Uh, we learn from history, and maybe it has something to say about uh, our present things today. But the truth is that there will come a final judgment. And if we are not, well, we hear in Revelation chapter 20 what happens. Everyone will judge, be judged by what they have done out of the books. And everyone whose name has not been, is not found written in the Lamb's book of life will be thrown into hell. There is a day of reckoning. But if your name is in the Lamb's book of life, if you believe in him, you are forgiven and you will be saved. Let us hold fast our confidence. Let us draw near to God and let's encourage each other. That's the end of the warning. Serious because it speaks the truth. But remember, your name is in the book of life. So you don't have anything to fear. But as you don't have anything to fear, that's not an excuse to go willfully sinning any way you want, but rather to come back and follow God. We're, we're coming to the end now and, uh, and a, a, a final uh, encouragement. 
And this final encouragement is, is a, a word that says, remember what you've come through. You can make it. The, the, whoever is the recipient uh, of these words from the book of Hebrews, the intended initial recipient, they are probably of Jewish heritage. And because they become Christians, they have lost the protection that Jews had under Roman law, and they have been suffering persecution. And so we'll hear that in these words at the end of chapter 32. But hold fast that faith. And then what is this faith? Well, it's been exemplified throughout the whole Old Testament. You'll see it in Hebrews 11 when we come there tomorrow. Verse 32, but recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. After you came to faith, the light was turned on, you came to faith in Christ. After you were enlightened, you endured, endured a hard struggle with sufferings. Sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and publicly you suffering, and sometimes being partners with those so treated, fellow church members, fellow family members who were persecuted for the faith. So either once you became a Christian, you were enlightened, you either went through it yourself or you had loved ones or close friends who, who went through persecution. No, more words about that. Uh, sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison. How were they ill-treated? Some were put in prison. And you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. People stole the homes, the property of Christians, declared them illegal, forced them to leave their villages, and took their property. A joy, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. You gave up the things of this world. Seek first, Jesus said, um, not what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear, or what your food going to have, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be given to you. They believed that and they experienced that as they gave up the things that they could never hold on or take to heaven and they received the gifts of God that they could never lose. The gifts God wants you to relish and enjoy. since they knew that you yourselves have a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you are, have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. And now, quotes from Isaiah chapter 26 and Habakkuk chapter 2. Yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we are of those who have faith and persevere and preserve their souls. No, we won't shrink back. We have faith. And then we come to the great chapter of faith, Hebrews chapter 11, tomorrow evening. Well, thank you for letting me be with you. Sorry for the interruption and having to restart. Um, and uh, hopefully be fully charged tomorrow. Um, God bless you. And uh, let me have a quick prayer. Lord, we often forget what the truth is. The truth are, is that we are fully justified, fully forgiven, and fully sanctified. Completely made perfect already by Jesus. Yet we are living into it, we who are being sanctified. So Lord, let us not be frustrated with each other. And let us not be overly frustrated with ourselves. Let us always turn to you, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and became obedient to the Father, even unto the cross. Fill us with that Christ-like blessings and attitude. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for joining me. Remember always, God loves you, and so do I. Good night. Bye-bye.